so yes we have a wonderful book and um it took us a while to get through the first part we seem to stay a long time in the anger section which was interesting because <laughs> i guess that's the one that people have a lot to talk about now. which is good right because we're here to actually apply these things so that it helps us in the areas that we're stuck so this is not so much a lecture hopefully not at all but it's to bring the Buddha's words to you and to open them up a bit in a way that's practical and applicable and relevant to your lives. So myself and Venable Lepeka will be kind of giving our little comment as we feel as we see fit on um, on what we read. But we'll also be pausing at various places to ask for any questions or complaints. In the spirit of my teacher, Ajahn Ram, he always has questions, comments, and complaints, the three C's, he calls it, even though question starts with a Q. And um, and then uh, we'll have some discussion around what we read. And even if something comes up in your practice that is not directly related, I think that's also okay, because it's quite rare, isn't it, to sit down with Dhamma friends and to be able to discuss the Dhamma in this way. Except if you come to Anakampa Vihara, where we do it every tea time. We're very privileged. So actually, there are three other people that you don't see here. We have Chi with us. I don't oh. know if you want to come and wave at the group. You can at the end, at least. And we have Casey, who's... I keep getting you messed up with Cass, because we have Cass and we have Casey. <laughs> They're both from America. And we have Matthias, who obviously everybody knows, but he's usually not in the same room, but now he's in the same room. And uh, it's really nice to see Matthias, actually, because I've seen you before and after the retreat and you really are kind of twinkly. It's very mm -hmm. nice to see the results, you know, sitting in retreat in Derbyshire with our Jambal Mali. So we are now on page one, three, two, which is the section on disputes, which I'm sure will captivate everybody's interest. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, this is one of the biggest reasons for our suffering. In mm -hmm. a relationship, isn't it? And sometimes mm -hmm. we're in dispute with ourselves. <laughs> this can also be one of the most difficult things. So here we have, first, uh, it's a verse from the Anguttara Nikaya number 2, 37, and it's called Disputes Among Lay People and Disputes Among Ascetics. So even ascetics have disputes. Sorry to disappoint you, but when you put on the robe, it does not change your personality. It does not take away all roots of disputes, but rather it almost brings to the fore those areas that are keeping you stuck. And it actually requires, especially living in community, that we work through these in a skillful way, because if we don't, um, it spills out into the lay community and people can feel it very quickly. So obviously human beings who are not stream winners or above, still have a sense of self and still will have that sense of self hurt from time to time by what we think other people think about us or what we start to think about us or what we imagine that other people might be thinking that we think about us. <laughs> and, da, da, da. <laughs> and it can all get very complicated. So um, <clears throat> anyway, speaking from experience here. So probably we should get into the sutta and then we'll see where it goes. So, shall I start? And you could do the next one, maybe. All right. A Brahmin approached the Venerable Maha Kachaya, Kachana, actually, there is Kachaya now, but this is Kachana. It does the same. And asked him, Why is it, Macha, Master Kachana, that the Katyas fight with Katyas, Brahmins with Brahmins, and householders with householders? <coughs> so the Katyas and the Brahmins are different. Um, uh, castes actually in India at that time. The Katyas are like the warrior caste. The Brahmins were like the um, kind of priests, the religious people. Not that religious because they fight. And householders with householders. Now I would think that they would be comprised of both of those. So I'm not quite sure why there's a distinction there. But it's interesting that here we're comparing different groups who fight within themselves, isn't it? And I think one of the things that can sometimes happen is that we actually um, find more to kind of niggle over when people are a bit closer to us. And maybe when there's actually more in common, we notice the bits that are not in common. I think somebody in this group said one time that they're more likely to feel jealous of somebody who's the same age and sort of maybe 
in a similar job or you know kind of wanting the same things in life and maybe this also has to do with it that sense of uh, comparison and maybe jealousy mm-hmm. and let's see what the buddha says so why is it much master katana the ascetics fight oh sorry skipped a bit sorry you'll have to bear with me i'm really tired today all right back up to the second paragraph it is brahmin because of adherence to lust for sensual pleasures bondage to sensual pleasures that katyas fight with katyas brahmins with brahmins and householders and householders adherence to lust for sensual pleasures bondage to sensual pleasures And he continues, why is it Master Kachana <clears throat> that ascetics fight with ascetics? It is Brahmin because of adherence to lust for views, bondage to views, that ascetics fight with ascetics. <laughs> That's really interesting, isn't it? So in the world, I guess, one of our main pursuits, if you're not a monastic, is pleasure through the senses, right? That is the world that you live in most of the time. And obviously you want to find pleasure, so that's why you're going to seek it. So it's this adhering to lust. I find that interesting. Not just lust for sensual pleasures, but adhering to the lust. In other words, seeing that lust as a source of happiness, right? Almost being addicted to craving, addicted to wanting. Because there's some kind of pleasure, we think, in the wanting itself. You know, this is why sometimes we get the um, the kind of object of our pl- of our wanting, and that doesn't satisfy us because what we're craving for is the sensation of wanting, the feeling of wanting and lusting, and uh, there's something in that that makes you feel you're kind of getting yeah. somewhere. Yeah, it makes you feel alive. Yeah, it makes you feel like I'm somebody doing right. something. Yeah, and that's what that what gives a kick. Yeah, it doesn't matter what it is. Right, I am doing it sense of self the sense of the doer yeah Yeah. Mm. in a similar way to anger i would say you know sometimes we're angry even though it's painful because it gives us a sense that we're solid that we have a view you know that i matter Mm. yeah so here is the adherence to lust the bondage to sensual pleasures so you're a slave of those pleasures even if you don't want to um you know even if you want to come out of it the habit is so strong that you don't really know where you are without these things. And if you haven't got another kind of deeper happiness in the mind through meditation, you know, then you'll resort to that again and again. But then it's interesting, isn't it, that when we become ascetics, so this is anybody, and I'm not sure the Buddha's speaking exclusively about um, so-called, well, they weren't really Buddhists, but then he's not necessarily speaking about his disciples here. He's talking about people who've left the householder's life and who've gone forth and actually given up some of these sensual pleasures, at least on the surface, right? They've made a break from that bondage. Yet still, the sense of self causes them to adhere to something else now. So instead of adhering to the sensual pleasures, it starts to get very uptight about views. I think this, but you're wrong. They've got it wrong. This word means that, and this word, no, 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 the word means the same. No, it means something different. (laughs) And Ben Blipek is laughing because much as we have very deep respect for our dear teacher, Ajahn Pamali, he loves to talk about uh, lots of points of Dhamma that he gets quite impassioned about. And personally, I quite enjoy that. I mean, I really quite enjoy that because as long of as course, I, agree. I think he's right. As long as, <laughs> as long as I agree. But if you were one of the people who he was saying has wrong with you, you wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> And I think, um, well, I'll read through a bit more of it, but I would like to discuss a little bit about that because sometimes we can get trapped there, you know, and we can have that sort of sense of moral righteousness or rightness. And it may very well be in line with the texts, right? It may very well be uh, um, correct according to right view. But the Buddha is still saying that adherence to lust for views, right? Wanting that, wanting to be right and getting that kick from being right. And that being bound to views actually can be an obstacle because until you've realized, you know, Mm. the teachings for yourself, no matter how right you might feel you are, it it can reinforce a sense of self. I mean, 
I do think there's such a thing as right for you and it's important to be clear on what that is yeah but to also recognize that for most of us it's still an intellectual understanding it hasn't really permeated very deeply and of mm. course in this particular sutta we're talking about how these things cause disputes among ascetics and this is kind of the art of being able to teach or proclaim of you without putting other people down right without yeah. saying these people and this person in particular by name is wrong <laughs> and I find myself inclining to that sometimes you know the people in this such and such a place and then I sort of have to say okay there's no such thing as a they right there's no such thing as they think this way because everybody's individual and um, it's almost like we don't give people a chance to have a different perspective because mm. we've already boxed them up we've already boxed them up it can also happen a lot with social media can't it you know because on social media you get a very kind of um superficial expression of your thoughts mm. very surface level mm. and then people argue with it without knowing who you are or what you meant by it and actually sometimes if you meet that very same person mm. within one or two sentences you're on the same page Mm. you know but when you kind of think no that is what they meant I know that's what they meant mm. <laughs> and you mm. respond to that it's kind mm. of yeah it inflames right. an argument very quickly right. it feels as though we take one point of view and we make an entire person out of it wow. forever more past and future they will always be having this point of view <laughs> which now you <laughs> yeah and it might have only been a flip comment. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the Buddha then says, is there anyone then in the world who's overcome this adherence to lust for sensual pleasures and this adherence to lust for views? <clears throat> there it is. And who is that? In the town to the east called Savati, the blessed one, the Arahat, the perfectly enlightened one is now dwelling. The Blessed One has overcome this adherence to lust for sensual pleasures and this adherence to lust for views. When this was said, the Brahmin rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, lowered his right knee to the ground, reverently saluted in the direction of the Blessed One, and uttered this inspired utterance three times. Homage to the blessed, <laughs> homage to the blessed one, the arahat, the perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed one, the arahat, the perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed one, the arahat, the perfectly enlightened one. Indeed, that blessed one has overcome this adherence to lust for sensual pleasures, and this adherence to lust for views. Well, that's nice, isn't it? That the Brahmin recognized those two things as such a danger and such a cause of dispute that he was so delighted to know that, you know, the Buddha had overcome this. And that was enough for him to pay homage to him as a fully enlightened being. I don't know if that implies that, you know, it's uh, it takes quite a lot <laughs> to overcome these things, right? Because our views form such a deep part of who we think we are. Yeah. and it's only really at stream winning that um wrong view is overcome and yet still you know we can still think in terms of the self and perceive in terms of the self apparently until a much later stage on the path mm. so there's still a possibility to have dispute but it's interesting mm. i mean out of the people i've met that i have confidence in as having you know attained to right view they very rarely argue with anybody, or if they do, it's kind mm. of for fun. Mm. You know, they know the right measure, mm. they know the right context. Mm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Ajahn Brahm always says to me, you know, you don't criticize a person, mm. you just teach, like you don't even criticize wrong view necessarily, but you teach right view. Of course, that might mean sometimes pointing out things that are kind of off course, but never in terms of a person being wrong. Right? Mm. more that the view is out of um, out of sync with the way the Buddha teaches and then referring to the suttas, referring to the, the texts. 
And I think that really depersonalizes it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? If we can refer to the teaching, because mm -hmm. otherwise, I mean, how can one person be so sure? Sometimes we think people are are right because they're clever, because they have a you know very articulate way of expressing themselves or expressing mm -hmm. the Dhamma. We think they must know, they must be right. But mm -hmm. actually, until it really sinks down to the level of view, like really right view and and you know, you see through non-self or you see through the illusion of a self. Um, it's very likely you'll have this adherence to views, which can mm. obviously block the path. Mm. Yeah. I was asking Ajahn Pramali about this because um I actually worry sometimes when senior monks who I will not name, um, or anybody, right? People who've been practicing a long time still seem to have views that don't seem to accord with the suttas. And I kind of wonder like does that kind of block them? You know, is that is that really a big problem? Because sometimes they have deep meditation. But he was saying that it, it will be a block, you know, because that means that when you do get into certain deep states, especially jhanas, you may um, assume that this is union with God, right? This is kind of the essence of consciousness or like original mind or whatever it is, because you don't have that proper context and that can be an obstacle. And I think that can be a kind of adherence to views. And the other thing that's so powerful about those states otherwise is that they do um, they do weaken our preconceived views as well because they clear the mind from hindrances. So it's kind of both, but I don't know. It's It, it sort of shows me the importance of, on the one hand, trying to learn to align our view with the Buddha, but understanding it's a kind of working hypothesis as long as we haven't experienced that ourselves mm. I don't know mm. what do you think because I know that you've said to me before that you get a little bit upset when people are very adamant about their view even exactly. if it seems to be it's, right view it's again <laughs> it's not my view so huh? <laughs> my view is a uh, is that uh uh yeah, we're just so attached to our way of seeing the world. Mm. And um, I get upset with adamancy. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I agree with them. <laughs> and is that because? Because uh, it is wrong to be so adamant. Ah, so that is a view too. <laughs> yes, yes. So it does not agree it? with my way, the way mm. I, I view the world. You should not be so adamant. Ah, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Many levels. <laughs> Many levels. <laughs> yeah, and then I might think someone shouldn't be so flaky. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we've talked a lot about this, but would people like to ask or comment on this? Because, I mean, I find it quite interesting because... You know, how do we kind of, um, what do you say, like reconcile this idea of not being, not adhering or having lust or bondage to views with actually having quite a strong understanding of right view? How do you think we can maneuver there? Okay, we'll come to Shirley and then we have Casey in the room. Did you want me to speak first? Yes, please. Yeah, I think it's really it's really interesting, and um, I've sort of reflected on this a lot recently because it it just seems that sometimes teachers seem to be saying different things, and sometimes religions seem to be taking saying quite different things, mm -hmm. and words can get in the way. And mm -hmm. how do you express these? How do you express the inexpressible? Mm -hmm. And it's 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 when you sort of make these experiences into a thing and when you take mm -hmm. them as self it's that sort of movement I think I, I remember mm -hmm. once years ago having a conversation at an interfaith group with a Christian and we were having this sort of debate and we were up, up, we, it seemed we were had totally opposing views and then when we talked a bit mm -hmm. more we realized that we were saying the same thing but mm -hmm. with different words mm -hmm. so I do feel we have to be mm. quite, quite, quite careful. Um, 
in sort of judging other people. So then I think mm -hmm. there definitely is um there definitely is wrong view, which is you know, taking anything as a self or, you know, yeah. I can't I can't put it, I've not got the words for it. I yeah. can't express myself very well. But yeah. I think words can really um so I think some Christian mystics would talk about union with God and they may have got it but they didn't see God as a person or a thing or a, you know, it's just a, God is just a word. Nirvana is just a word. You mm, know, it's not, the, it's not the thing itself. And yeah. they can easily get into a terrible argument about it. Yeah. And it may be the person who's sort of got the more awkward and clumsy way of expressing it is nearer to the truth and the person who could actually huh. say it, but is actually, it's this grasping of views and saying, I'm, you know, however pure and lofty and true the view is, if you say, this is my view and this is what I think and this is right, that's um, that, that sort of, that, that's sort of the attachment to view. But in a way, you do have to attach to right view because we're so yeah, wobbling, right. like, wobbling yeah, away yeah. and taking yeah, things personally. Yeah. So it's yeah, really... Yeah. It's really yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so also, and then, you... then there's this idea in the in the in the in the in the in the and what I love is this idea at the end of the Meta Sutta where Adrian Brahm likes not attaching to false views and Adrian Am Amaro likes uh, not attaching to fixed views because yeah, if yeah. you attach to a right view, then it becomes wrong view. So it's all <laughs> it's all quite subtle, really. I think. But oh. once you start identifying and arguing, then I think you've sort of fallen into <laughs> some sort of wrong view. Because uh -huh. uh -huh. if you could really see the truth mm -hmm. and somebody's, you can see that somebody's got it wrong, you're just going to very gently guide them. Somebody who's really right. wrong, like the Buddha, yeah. would, 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 would gently sort of no, well, not always, to... though, Shirley. Sometimes he says, you foolish man, you foolish man, you've fallen into the thicket of views. You know, sometimes... He will actually be quite firm. But yeah, but yeah, basically but that's what I think what you're maybe. saying is that, you know, language can also further yeah. consolidate this sense yeah. of, yeah. you know, being at odds yeah. when we're, yeah. maybe we're not yeah. as much at odds as yeah. we yeah. think we are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Gosh, we have lots of people with their hands raised, but I'm going to come to Casey because she did um, indicate that she would like to speak first. Then we'll come to the others in the, in the Zoom room. Mm. Yes. So uh, for me, I think first of, um, I find that when it comes to view and having debates and arguments, often for me personally, the reason that I might argue something is not necessarily because I want that person to find the right view so much as you, I want to be right. <laughs> it's an attachment to self in a lot of cases. It's like, but wait, you're telling me I'm wrong, but actually I know this is right view. I know this is what the Buddha said, but of course we're all deluded. So do we really know that? Or is that just our interpretation? Maybe like I have a false interpretation of what the Buddha said and yet I can't see it. So I'm, I am feel like attacked when somebody says that's not what the Buddha said. And so I think a lot of it comes down to, as we've talked so much in these sutta discussions about right speech and how right mm -hmm. speech should be you know, timely and with a purpose. Mm. And if when we are speaking about these views, we are speaking honestly with the intention of helping mm. guide this person to something that will decrease their suffering, mm. then I think that, of course, then that, that, that's not attachment to views. That is just, that's mm. compassion. compassion. That is yeah. Yeah. guiding yeah. someone towards the true Dhamma. But a lot of times I think it comes from attachment to self, this idea that I have a self and that myself should, like, I want myself to be correct. I want mm. to be praised I want to be I don't know why the one who is right yeah or just or just to be able to believe that my idea will lead me mm. to mm. down the Buddhist path mm. I want to have be able to have mm. that that confidence mm. that I'm walking in the right direction mm. and so if someone tells me my view is not right I want to prove that no I, I am going in the right mm. direction and so it all of it mm. comes back to this attachment to self sometimes when talking about the views and I think sometimes of um, 
the sutta about uh, the the goldsmith and about like purifying mm -hmm. the different levels of um, of defilements from the mind. And the, the last one is actually you have to even get rid of the attachment to views even of Dhamma, right? At the subtlest mm -hmm. level of, of that sutta, mm -hmm. that at the end, maybe not where we are, but even this attachment to Dhamma views has to be let go. Mm -hmm. And so any attachment to views, I think, especially when we're not yet stream winners and we don't yet know whether our views are 100% right or not. I think it can be at least dangerous. Um, and so sometimes it can be better to sit back unless we, um, yeah, unless we really are speaking of compassion and not any other motivation. Yeah. Just a point about the attachment to views and having to let go of attachment to views. I think it's important to bear in mind that it's the attachment to views, not the views. Because mm. the reason that you don't need attachment is because you have the view. <laughs> because mm. some people sometimes say, oh, well, you shouldn't be attached to sila, you know. And and people think that because you shouldn't be attached to sila, that means sila is not that important. Mm. But actually, it's you don't need to be attached when you actually have internalized virtue right and that's why the clinging to uh sila is overcome and stream winning as well because these things have actually taken root in the heart so that's why there's no but i think again yeah it's a really interesting one because what's coming up for me is that um yes we have to be careful not to you know think we know or kind of get attached and adhere to our views but is it any less dangerous to have a very uncertain view? Like, I kind of think it's maybe better to have right view in accordance with the Buddha, even if it's not at the level of stream winning yet. And maybe there's a little bit of attachment there still than to have actually wrong view, to have actually kind of, not a very clear sense of orientation with the path. It's just a kind of something that's coming up for me as a question, really. Mm. But not this, yeah. An interesting one. I don't know. Can we come to an under who's had his hand up for a while? This is our dear Luke. Hello. We'll come Everyone. to the chat as well. Uh, um, so I would just like to really kind of say, that you know as a lay person i think you know for me there's there's right views that we can hold very easily and directly that can really uh give us confidence and i think buddha mm -hmm. really kind of put this he put this very well and i think um one of the previous people said about there's a lot of people who say a lot of different views it really brought to mind i think the obvious sutta the uh the kalama sutta and i think the thing that i find most easiest to establish right view in is that when greed arises, when hate, hatred arises, and when mm. delusion arises, mm. they're never for one's benefit or for those yeah. around you. When, when these things arise, you can mm. very easily observe that they want to take you to do things of conflict and harm and mm. you know things that you might not do if you were thinking without these things. So I think we mm. all kind of know how, how in, in those things we can establish right view very quickly and have yeah. them the confidence in those things without really having to worry too much about anything else at least for me I'm not a person that likes to sometimes overthink it I'm quite a debater and you know I get very much into my views at times you know much like you know Ajahn Brahmali himself I very much love the love the love all that stuff but I can still even acknowledge at times that sometimes I'm just arguing to argue like I'm not really <laughs> I'm just being you know petty and no no you know so sometimes I've got to acknowledge where even I can get in my own way by getting into mm. the theory of views, as you might want to say. Mm. And yeah, kind of just uh, my short little, little mm. take. Yeah, yeah, thanks for reminding yeah. us that right yeah. view is not only kind of a view that, you know, <laughs> kind of the view that these candles are not oneself and all the rest, and there's no self to be found in these candles or anywhere else. But it's also the preliminary aspects of right view are just being able to differentiate what is for one's good and what is for mm. one's harm. This is actually mm. one's well, right view. I think yeah, yeah. it's the, the nail yeah, yeah, on the yeah. head. Absolutely. It's when we it's end like, up getting upset over it or getting yeah. hit up over it, that's the problem. Yeah. In that yeah. sense, that's yeah. like... Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think Shirley said that actually. Yes. But in that sense, yes. you have wrong view at that time. Even yes. if your view might be intellectually correct. Right. It's not right view in the sense that it's not leading you out of suffering, right. it's causing suffering. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So it's kind of ironic yes. that right view is supposed to lead out of suffering, but actually we can end up fighting over it if there's lost an attachment to it yes. involved. Yeah. And yeah. delusion yeah. because that sense of identity, yeah. uh, a sense of uh, yeah. I-ness is increasing. Sometimes, but sometimes <laughs> not, right? Because sometimes we, we take on faith. What well, that's said. what. So we know for ourselves. Right. We know for ourselves. I know for we myself. Know for ourselves when I know for getting... myself and I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll come to Benjamin and then we'll read out Bill's question. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering when views are discussed in Buddhism, how broad the definition is, because we have ideas of like, I think John Donne is the best metaphysical poet. That's my view on metaphysical poets. <laughs> um, but we also have deep seated beliefs that we may be not even remotely conscious of. And I'm wondering mm. if those sorts of things also come under the category of views. Mm, mm. Right. You mean in this sutta, in this context, I guess. Adherence, to lust, for, adherence mm. to lust for views. I think mm. that's always the case. We don't even realize. Mm -hmm. We don't even realize that we have this that underlying have view. Views, yeah. That and that's the problem. We mm. don't even realize we have this underlying view of self. That's uh, quietly running the show. Mm. Yeah, mm. And that's what we. When the mind becomes quiet, you start to go, "Oh, aha." I've been doing this my whole life, thinking that it was normal. Yes. Yeah, so. I guess one of the yardsticks is really um, whenever you catch some kind of view, self-belief, whatever it is that leads to suffering, right, that leads to the mm. unwholesome qualities increasing, right, then right. you know there's something off. Right. Because if it's a view in line with the Dhamma, it should lead to peace. Mm. I mean, the Buddha says that, right? If right it's really right. the Dhamma. Yeah, it should lead to peace. disentanglement as well. That's a nice one. Mm. It should lead to kind mm. of um, serenity. It mm, should lead mm, to mm, peace. Mm. It should lead out of suffering. Mm, mm. So that's how you know. And I guess mm. any time that we're th our thinking goes off track, like if we're thinking about a situation in ways that's just tying us in knots and making us think, right, that's it. Mm. Um, you know, mm. I'm going to tell that person next time I see them or like, <laughs> or I'm so poor me. I, was, I get this sometimes. Poor me. I have all the responsibility. No one else has any and they don't understand. Ah! <laughs> and then my thinking's going off track, you know, because I'm relating to responsibility in an unhelpful way. So it's a kind of view, you know, especially when I think, oh, they don't care about me. That's why they're not really helping me. You know, they don't get like, really they don't work fast like they need to work fast so that we can get through this and because they don't work fast that means they don't care about me or something like that I notice I have a view like that sometimes it's really weird right it's really weird but this is not a helpful view but I think in this particular sutta the Buddha's probably speaking more generally probably toward the views that were prevalent in India at that time and there are some views like this listed in the suttas and the Brahma Jala suttas, it like 32 different types of prevalent view. And there were like about six that were very prevalent. And there were things like whether there's karma and rebirth, whether there's like a, an effect of our actions at all. So there was one fella. They're all fellas, actually. I don't know. Maybe there were female well, thinkers were, too, but it was, was a very patriarchal country. Um and one of them said, well, even if you, you know, go out with a knife and cut up beings so that they're one mass of flesh, there's no result of that action whatsoever, you know, basically, um, which is crazy, right? Because, I mean, results happen as we act, not only in the afterlife. I mean, how do you feel when you're doing that? I can't imagine. So that's the result. So they had some really crazy way out views. And I guess Brahmins also would have had quite a lot of views being the sort of spiritual uh, class or caste. <clears throat> um, yeah. So I guess the Buddha's really coming at the point that it can cause dispute, it can cause suffering. And yeah, it can basically cause people to fight. It's, mm. it's a really nice sutta actually, because it, it makes me think this Brahmin must have been quite well developed that he only had to hear that adherence to those things is 
it's such a problem for him to have a, you know, and that there was somebody without that adherence mm. to be called mm. the Buddha, and that was enough for him mm. to obey. Because it's scary, mm. isn't it, to give up view? Because then you might feel directionless. Mm. I notice, you know, I like to have a very clear sense of right and wrong view, so that I have an orientation, so that I feel I know which way the paths go. Otherwise, I feel even lost. I would feel lost. Anyway, I don't know if that actually answers what Benjamin was asking. Though. <laughs> We had a good rant. We had a good rant. <laughs> it's dangerous sometimes when I'm tired. I, I go on more, travel on. Anyway, yeah, we're having lots of views, aren't we? But we're not fighting, so that's good. <laughs> and um, there's something, Bill, do you want to read that one up? Okay. Yeah. Is the attachment to self just about our beliefs through thought. beliefs, thought? about our beliefs, thought, and feelings. Mm. I can't wrap my mind around this concept. Chaspin to self, just about our belief. Attachment to self, just about our beliefs, thoughts, and feelings. Um, I mean, the attachment of self is the five khandhas. So it is attachment to form, attachment to feeling, attachment to perception, and attachment to mental formations, attachment to sense consciousness. That's where the self hides in any of those five uh, places. So thoughts and feelings and beliefs are just one of the five khandhas, but the self hides in any one of those places, if that answers your question. Mm. But it's not only attachment to the khandhas that's a problem, it's the khandhas themselves, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Right, right, right. Right. I don't know. If, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, I'm not quite sure either. I guess, in a sense, that's true. Attachment to self is largely about view, I think. And um, view is formed of feelings and thoughts and the way we think about things, the way we perceive things, the way we kind of cogitate and uh, relate, I suppose. I mean, the vipalasas are all about thinking, view, and perception, and these three mm. kind of feed delusion. So it's views, perceptions, and thoughts about the world that kind of consolidate the idea of a self or the idea of permanence or um, that there's some happiness to be found in the world. Um, they're kind of distortions of reality. So in a sense, you could say it's mostly view, right? Attachment to self is mostly, yeah, I'm not really sure I understand the question entirely. Mm. The thing is, I guess, the sort of question to ask is what what are you attaching I'm to it's like what are you taking yourself to be right what is it that you're identifying with that you're taking to be a self it's an inquiry you know i mean some people very much take the body to be sense of self or to be themselves some people very much take their kind of feelings, you know, they're very identified with the way they feel. Some people are more inclined to take their kind of views and their intellect as a self. But it's always a combination, really. It's We take all of that to be a sense of self, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at any of them with that question, you know, do I take this to be a self? Then you'll probably find that these things are impermanent. And if it's impermanent and also if, it's, if it causes suffering, it can't really be a self. You know, our views are changing all the time, too. Mm. <laughs> he says, I have some understanding. I'm driving, not smoking. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I'm glad you're driving, not drinking either. I think that goes, <laughs> that goes uh, taken for granted. So it's a combination of who I think I am. Yeah, it's a combination. It's like whatever we think we own is where the sense of self is, right? Anything we think we own is also what we take to be a self. Mm. Uh, so Shelley says, I think Maha Kachana was an arahat, so he himself had let go of attachment to sense pleasures and views, but he pointed to the Buddha rather than saying, well, I have no attachments mm. because he was humble. Mm. Very nice. Mm. 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 Yeah, that's true. He would have also yeah, overcome that. Yeah, that's of course. True. I mean, the thing is, the Buddha was the most incredible teacher, right? He was a, a Buddha. So, of course, you would point people to yeah, mm. the best teacher mm. that there is. Yeah. Yeah. Ananda, shall we come to you again and then maybe open to 
Hello. Hello. Uh, what is your view on this? <laughs> that was what I was going to say. I think like the view is simply to say like I am. Like I think I think like the Buddha was not someone that was like you know a self identity is is something at the higher like stages of the training. I'd say is the thing that you're going to sort of be detached from a view of I am this way, I am that way, I am this thing, I am this body. I think the views of self are like can be broken down into like thousands of I ams we say about ourselves in lots of ways even in ways we don't think about it even in very simple ways a lot of the time we say i am angry i am sad i am happy these emotions i would say confidently for myself i don't i actually don't think i self but just experiences they're feelings you can you can look at them and um one nun i really like often used to say um you know your mind tells you these things but i mean who said you have to listen to them right like who said they are they are you and you, you know, you didn't tell them to come up in your mind, they just come. So you haven't got to say, oh, this is me, I must take this, this is what I am. You can just acknowledge that, okay, there is this feeling, there is anger, there is happiness, there is sadness. And, you know, just let it rise and cease. And I think that's, um, that's the easiest view for me to come to in regards to that. I can't say I've had much view on anything um, more than that, but yeah. Mm. I mean, these are all good ways of practice, right? Mm. To sort of see, oh, anger is arising and, mm. and notice how anger feels rather than I am identifying it. Mm. You know, saying I am angry and identifying with it. But the thing is, even by changing the language, it doesn't do it. It doesn't go deep enough, right? Because you kind of know what you're attached to when it's threatened, when somebody threatens to take it away. So, you know, we can think that we're not attached to the body, right? We know it's not me. I mean, it's pretty obvious. It changes all the time. I showed Ajahn Brahmali a photograph of me when I was in India, and he said, is that you? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, no, it's not. And I mean, I have kind of figured that, right? I mean, <laughs> this is just something that morphed from that. <laughs> but um, still, if somebody comes and says, okay, you know, uh, give me your, I don't know, your vihara, otherwise I'll, I'll kill you. Or something. I, I don't know how mm. I'd feel about that. Mm. Would I be ready to just say, okay, fine? Mm. You know, how would we actually be when that thing that we hold dear is mm. uh is threatened? That's where we mm. can see there's a sense of self in there. Usually it happens <laughs> when we have a little bit of an ache or a pain or a yeah, right. and just oh, a no. little sniffle. What's happening? Huh. Yeah, a little sniffle. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to uh-huh. say for that? Okay, it was mentioned a few times that right view leads to peace, but often the fundamental views like impermanence, the fact that we don't hold on to anything and the change ability of self-perception gives rise to a lot of fear for me. I suppose this is because of attachment. It makes me feel like there is nothing to be certain of and causes much anxiety. At other times, it tends to be when I already feel at ease, these views simply resonate deeply. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying, uh, you know, these views, it's like that they're, if it leads to, leads to more unwholesome states of mind, then whatever, however accurate the view may be, it's not helping you because it's leading to more and more unwholesome states of mind. So you think, oh, no, but I must sit with this pain or, you know, I have, um, Yes, so um, I I agree. I agree. If the uh, I, you you know fundamental view of impermanence is just making you feel more and more anxious, sitting through more and more anxiety, I guess there's a degree of patience that one has to be with as well. Yeah, it's worth worth. Um, investigating and seeing what's happening there yeah maybe sometimes one just has to be with the anxiety what do you think yeah I think um in a sense this is the difference between like having a view um that resonates and the actual experience of letting go of something the actual practice you know and I think you're right it's when something's threatened you know the sense of um, a solid self is threatened that anxiety arises and it's in, in exactly because of mm. attachment Ajahn Brahm always says that's a very good sign 
So because unless you actually meet that place where you're starting to see that something's impermanent, anxiety is not going to arise, you know, because the views aren't really supposed to be um, easy. <laughs> Something leads to peace doesn't mean you're going to have peace immediately. It means you're going to have peace when you finally understand that there is no self, right? Eventually it leads to peace, but the process is uh, going to be challenging to the sense mm -hmm. of self. If the sense of self wasn't being challenged, then you'd be actually kind of deluding yourself that you weren't attached to these things. Um, so we are attached to these things. We can think we know what impermanence is, what non-self is, but most of us don't. You know, we know it to a certain point and beyond that, the sense of self won't let us go any deeper. That's why fear comes up in meditation. You know, it's classic that it comes up all the way into, you know, to the foot, to the kind of... Uh, doorstep of jhana that's where a lot of fear can come up and the buddha talks about that how it happened to him as well you know and the monks in in the upakilesa sutta the buddha talks about that and the monks there were also practicing with um fear arising when uh when lights or forms would arise in their mind in other words when the meditation would become powerful they'd realize that you know in order to take the next step they'd have to let go of something that they thought was a self so it's not like Mara, delusion, is going to let go of you easily. And that's why Ajahn Brahm always tries to encourage meditation as something that's really pleasurable so that you actually really enjoy the process. It's almost like a trick. It's not just because he's kind of, oh, I just want bliss or something like this. It's because it's a kind of very clever way of outwitting Mara. So you focus on the joy and this becomes so strong that it overcomes the fear and you just say, well, never mind, even if I have to let go of something, I can't resist it because there's too much happiness to be found. So um, basically, mm. it's a good thing. It's fine. But I think it's nice that at other times you can, and when you're at ease, you can have those views simply resonating with you because, you know, you don't want to push it too far. Mm too fast too soon kind of thing it's nice to also have that time in your daily life to reflect and to read and to take it in when you're in the right frame of mind and um and just go gently in your practice i would say yeah yeah can't hold on mm. to anything yeah i mean i had a lot of fear in the beginning of my practice maybe not a lot but i remember when i was practicing it was a different kind of method i suppose basically we were focusing on the changeability of feelings mostly right sensations and it'd get to the point where the whole body would just dissolve very fast i mean you'd get to the point where you couldn't feel it as solid anymore and it would just be kind of falling away like sandbanks and this is a common experience in that practice in that kind of practice because you're really focusing on the change and the mindfulness gets incredibly sharp and perceptive that you feel like nothing is solid. Everything's just disappearing almost as soon as it arises, even faster than it arises at some point. And um, yeah, sometimes I realize, wow, everything I thought was mine, everything that I loved was actually just nothing but a kind of mirage, nothing but kind of things falling, like sand falling through my fingers, you know. And I, I remember going to Goenkaji, this was in like 1998 or something, and I said, oh, when that happens, I feel this way. And he said, yeah, you know, it's just a stage in the practice. And uh, that was kind of enough for me, you know. I mean, of course, there's other stages I've yet to go through to sort of overcome the fear or even to get the fear coming up. But uh, I think it's just natural. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, after that, when it's integrated, you do feel more uh, reconciled to the nature of things yeah and that brings peace because you don't try to hold on so much you just mm -hmm. enjoy things without holding them you can still enjoy them <laughs> there's a story of a monk a chinese monk in world war ii about self am i the awareness watching this program right now no you are not awareness is just conditioned <laughs> yeah Actually, I really appreciate this from my first teacher who was, you know, he wasn't um, an arahat or whatever, but he had a lot of wisdom and he would say, it's consciousness that conceives. In other words, it's uh, awareness that's aware. <laughs> we, we add the I. <laughs> we say, I am aware, I feel, I see, etc. It's exactly the same for all the five kandas. Awareness is no different whatsoever. It's vinyana, mano vinyana, the six types of vinyana. 
right? There's eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, body consciousness, tongue consciousness, and mind consciousness. Is that six? And mind consciousness too is impermanent. The Buddha says this throughout the suttas again and again. So I know that this idea of being the awareness is found in some traditions. And I think mostly it's uh, either traditions or uh, people, people who've had the experience of maybe a very wide, very vast, very blissful consciousness, which can happen in deep meditation. But it's not the extent of the Buddha's teachings. For him, he's saying that this characteristics of impermanence and non-self are basically permeate everything permeate everything yeah sabbe sankara dukkha anicca sabbe dhamma anatta everything all phenomena are non-self so we're not the awareness but you know we have to identify with something i guess at first right and our identification is kind of subtler increasingly subtle um, and a lot of people get stuck here. Also in the Vipassana meditation, you can get stuck at this point where you feel like every single thing you're watching is, is impermanent. But there's this delusion that the thing watching is permanent. But actually, if the object would fade away, so would the mind. But this is kind of a high stage of practice, right? Uh, but it's good. I think it's good to get the at least the Buddha's teaching clearly in mind. And if you read anywhere in the uh, Kanda Samyutta of the Samyutta Nikaya or the Nidana Samyutta, it talks about how awareness is conditioned and um, uh, dependently arisen. Yeah. Sitting with anxiety is tough. Yeah, well, we need tools. We need extra tools to sit with these things. We can't just go in there with our ordinary kind of mind that's going to get a little bit overwhelmed by it because it's unpleasant. And so we need to actually develop a lot of metta in our minds in order to uh, be able to stay present to things like anxiety, a lot of self-compassion, yeah, gentleness, not just like, right, I'm going to be here with anxiety no matter what, I'm not going to move, I'm just going to sit here and no matter how bad it is, because your mind is just going to contract and get tense and tight. So we have to be extremely gentle with ourselves. And I think um, it's about, you know, having a balanced practice in daily life so that you are resourced with these qualities of loving kindness that you can almost like pull out of your tool bag at any time. Yeah, and, and by practicing these things as well in daily life, it's less likely that anxiety is going to arise at all. And if it does, you'll be able to meet it with a lot of kindness. Anxiety and meditation has thrown me off practicing for a while. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there's other ways you can practice when a lot of anxiety is coming up. Mm. You know, it might not be the best time to do sitting meditation. Maybe it's a good mm. time to do some walking meditation. Just pace around. It doesn't matter. Pace up and down. Get into your body, you know, feel the ground underneath you. I mean, pace, but not indefinitely. Like, I mean, have a walking path, sort of have a designated area and just kind of let yourself move a little bit. Feel your body, ground yourself, kind of get a sense of perspective. Maybe, you know, open your eyes or or just sit by a view and look at a horizon. This is apparently very good for balancing the nervous system. Yeah, sometimes these things are physiological. Sometimes they come up because of hor- a lack of hormones or something like this. It happens a lot in menopause. Um, I was having a lot of anxiety last year. It was unbelievable, actually. It felt like my whole body, my whole world was literally caving in on me. It was absolutely bizarre. It just come over me. And then my um, one of my doctors would say it's uh, like a progesterone crash, like it's a hormone but it feels so real, you know? Mm. And at those times, sometimes I couldn't keep sitting. I mean, sometimes I could, it depends how resourced my mind felt. But at other times it was good to do walking meditation or just to go on a walk in the bush or, you know, mm. if you live near a beautiful river, you yeah. can do some river yeah. walking. Yes. No, I have to say I had came to that stage once while spending a lot of time meditating, yeah. like on, on like a, I was four months, five months on retreat. Yeah. And uh, I just stopped meditating. Mm. I absolutely could not. And just left it as, mm. just just couldn't for a couple of years, actually. Oh, really? A couple, couple of years. years mm-hmm. I was just too, too much. The mind had gone to a, 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 a very uh, weird place. So I just left it aside for 
Well, I didn't. I just didn't plan to get back in. And one day, I just woke up again. <laughs> yeah, I, there was no no strategy there. Interesting. But, yeah. yeah, I mean that can maybe happen sometimes. I'm guessing it was like a four or five months kind of yeah. intensive, intense, retreat. and I was being being really over the top. Yeah, pushing yourself, yes. and sometimes yeah. the methods themselves push you too hard. And I, I think, you know, for some people it might work. And especially if you have a lot of, I don't know, if you've been practicing a long time beforehand. But even then, it, it's these things, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I had I, actually uh, been, I had been on a nine month retreat. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then after that, I thought, now I can really do it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe too much at once. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I was sleeping yeah. like three hours, four hours this a night. Help. And, uh, you mm-hmm. know, um, was on a bit of a high uh, and yeah. crashed and crashed <laughs> because it's actually not the middle way it's interesting because yeah. like Ajahn Pramali was saying actually on this uh on his tour somewhere or other maybe on the retreat that don't pay don't give too much authority to tradition to traditions no matter how established they are no matter how many you know whether they've been founded by so-called our hats because we don't know right I'm saying so-called not because I think they're not but because we don't know um don't give too much authority because still you have to measure it by the texts and i would say like making yourself sleep or even getting to the point where you're sleeping three hours a night is actually an extreme and it's not the middle way it's actually the um you know the uh aspect of one of the extremes which is um atakila matana yoga people think that means uh self-mortification but it actually means practices that exhaust the body tire the body and um yeah sometimes we move in ways that are not the middle way maybe out of eagerness or maybe just because Mm. there's a system that's not actually adapted to the individual you know it's it's something we kind of impose on ourselves you learn by mistakes yeah but that could be bad in some cases it could actually really tip somebody over and it does sometimes yeah i mean yeah i think it's kind of a shame right if yeah no yeah. i mean i thought it was good i never yeah. did it, do it again <laughs> okay yeah yeah but i mean in terms of in, anyway, what i would encourage people as yeah. you know someone yes, who tries yes. to follow the buddha's teaching i mean i wouldn't recommend taking the risk right i'd always recommend going gently um yeah mm-hmm. i mean it may be that you have they could come and so say you came back to the Dhamma, but that's not the case for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that answers Ananda's question, though. How to work with anxiety? Yeah. yeah. Not like that. <laughs> 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 I mean, don't go and sit yourself on a five-month retreat if you already have anxiety. <laughs> and uh, go gently. Yeah, go gently. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say it started off very well. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway you do these things yeah you never know it's very inspiring <laughs> to hear that everybody everybody kind of goes a bit this way or that way sorry. yeah <laughs> sleep yeah sure um i'm curious because this is something i've i've wondered uh a few times i was i think reading i don't remember which sutta the majjama nikaya and the one that talks about the um the different watches of the night and yeah. that it's divided into four watches and then the buddha is saying something yeah. about like you should be you know uh sitting during the first two and then sleep during the third and then wake up for the or no basically that you only sleep during one of those watches which seems to say that oh you should only be sleeping for the short amount of time and i never knew how to interpret that mm. As far as I understand it, he was saying what he was doing. Yeah. So this was a Buddha. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, in my experience, when you are on a retreat, you usually tend to sleep a bit less because the mind brightens up. But it should never be done by force. Like we have to actually listen to our body and and um yeah, just allow the process to happen naturally. Like Sometimes we're not well, right? And we need to sleep more. It doesn't mean that um, that you can't progress. So it doesn't mean even even people who are enlightened, they have to sleep, you know. So I don't think it's necessarily something to aim for or be seen as a measure of progress. 
I would see it more as just the body finds its natural balance, depending on how much the mind is also active, right? I mean, I remember one retreat in Perth where the mind was really, really quiet for quite a few weeks and um, and there was lots of energy and bliss in the mind. And then as soon as the a couple of thoughts started to come up again, even though they weren't like intense thoughts, I needed a whole extra hour of sleep, which was fascinating, you know, that it could actually... The mind could be that sensitive that it would notice the effect of thoughts. Um, so I think, you know, whatever sleep you need, I mean, obviously make sure you're not indulging, but also be careful not to veer on the side of sleep deprivation because everything goes wrong when we do. I mean, the whole, the body, the nervous system, the kind of uh, stress levels and everything increase and you're much more likely to feel kind of anxiety or um, even for traumas to be triggered or whatever if we're really unrested so yeah I, I would say um it's about that middle way again not indulging but also not kind of depriving oneself of sleep yeah what would you say no that's hard to find yeah hard to find mm. yeah. <laughs> that's interesting yeah. about needing more sleep uh, I tend to think a lot and need a lot of sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I really enjoy going to uh, Australia. And, well, I still sleep quite a lot because I'm getting old as well. But um, <laughs> but it's nice not to need as much, you know. And there's other times when you think so much and you're so busy that you actually can't sleep, right, because the nervous system gets kind of a bit overwrought. And that also takes its toll. And then we start to mm. age prematurely. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so it's now 10 to and I, I don't think it's probably going to work no, to start anything work, else no. so um, we'll just have five more minutes to to talk mm -hmm. about this and let's see if there's anything we can kind of summarise no. or any other Casey, just things to be anything. said mm -hmm. yeah, if, uh, no one else has a question just we talked a lot about the view part but I also think it's interesting the first part about why householders mm -hmm. householders mm -hmm. that, um he focuses on on the craving and the sensual lust because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we feel like the fighting has to come from the ill will but in fact yes. a lot of that ill will the mm -hmm. root cause of the ill will is mm -hmm. that sensual lust that mm -hmm. like the envy that person has something mm -hmm. and I want it mm -hmm. and um, so I thought that was an interesting mm -hmm. um, way yeah. to bring it back to mm -hmm. the craving and not necessarily just mm -hmm. ill will. yeah absolutely yeah yeah yeah, I mean, if you look at the problems in the world, it's often less, I think wars are fought less through ill will, because after all, people don't really know those individuals to have ill will towards them, you know, kind of people that are just totally innocent get killed. But it's more to do with power and greed, you know, and, and kind of particularly loss for power, actually. Um, and yeah, resources, right? Mm. So, I mean, there are many suttas where the Buddha actually says that a lot of these, you know, wars and kind of the devastation that we see is caused by greed. And also, if you look at things like the climate catastrophe, it's because of greed, isn't it? It's not because of ill will. It's not like I want more in, in you know, we want more in our country because we hate the people over in those poor countries. It, it's not that. It's actually, you know, just just being insatiable, fun. basically. Right, yeah, the next one's about conflict due to sensual pleasures coming in the next episode. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. please. Just thinking about one sutta, I think it's the Satipatthana Sutta. Um, <clears throat> and it, you know, refers to contemplating both internally and externally. I, I just saw, uh, I've been curious about what externally means, and I wonder yeah. if you can. Ajatta Bahida, yeah. It means in, so it just as it is in me. Did everybody hear the question? Can oh. we just check? Yeah, okay. It means just as it is in me, so it is in others. So I see in myself. Um, uh, sensations arising and passing away or you know that there are whatever it is you're contemplating so it is in others just as it is in myself so I kind of it's yeah so th this is 
also just part, part of contemplating, considering what other people's views are. This is yeah, you could yeah, you could say just like I have get upset over views, other people also get upset over views. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But in that context, in the Satipatthana, it's uh, more about the the body and the feelings. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the four Satipatthanas. But yeah. the it is also it for other people outside of yourself. Well. Yes, yeah, it does actually. I mean, that is very interesting. It's more to kind of realize that all beings essentially suffer in the same ways, right? So just as my body is impermanent and subject to suffering, subject to decay, so are other people's bodies. So it's always to have that perspective, you know, that we're just part of of the same laws of nature as everybody else. And I think it should give rise to compassion. Mm. That's kind of the idea, that it gives mm. rise to compassion and also, a, again, a lessening of the sense of self because we always think we're somehow different, right? we want to be different. And it's kind of to break those barriers and then... Um, just to understand the universality of suffering, that no matter who you are, no matter how clever you are or how strong you are or whatever, you still are going to experience, you know, all these things just like everybody else. So it's kind of a great equalizer in a sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I feel like uh, it's all about self in from yeah. Yeah. Get through the insula, but it's, yeah, thanks to. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah to kind yeah. of um the universality of the, mm -hmm. of our humanity we mm. are all the same mm. yeah yeah however rich or poor mm. or privileged or not or yeah mm. we're still gonna suffer yeah and i guess it's also so that we learn because I think self-view can apply to ourselves obviously most of the time that's where the problems are but we also self other people right we also see other people as these fixed entities and we kind of create them in our minds you know we create ourselves as being a certain way and then we create everybody else mm. as well and then when we see that actually they're also just conditioned processes <laughs> kind mm. of and what they experience is largely out of their control you know um then it can really help us to stop fixing other people in ways that mm. cause us suffering mm. yeah so we're going to wind up. It's almost, uh, we're almost done. There's a funny story of young Ajahn Amaro and the time he ever slept. So you can tell us that next time, maybe, uh, Ananda. And Shirley had a, a very funny uh, slip of misspelling because what is actually a temple. <laughs> so she said in what people are manipulated to hate the other by power, by the powerful who want even more power. But she meant wars not what's so i'm glad because i was worried there <laughs> but actually unfortunately it can happen in what's as well and there are a very minority of places even in some buddhist countries that have become a little bit like radicalization centers so yes it can happen everywhere actually um and maybe that's the funny thing about the spelling mistake is that you know we're all guilty of this to some mm. extent. I mean, even amongst our friendship circles, right? Mm. How many times do you kind of want to sort of convince or influence, maybe not mm. manipulate, but influence your friend to have the same view about that person you don't like as you have? Because you don't want your friend hanging around with someone you don't like, right? Oh. <laughs> so we do do this even in our own lives. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that little sutta will help us to live more in harmony with others and hold our views in ways that can be helpful for us and not irritating and a cause of conflict between ourselves and others. And I think one of the beautiful things about the Buddha's teaching and the way he taught was that he didn't tend to kind of enforce himself or his views on others. Most of the suttas, if you read them, are actually people coming to ask him questions. He usually doesn't go out and try to kind of force anything down people's throats he waits until he's approached and he figures out whether somebody's sincere or not and to the extent that they are he'll get he'll teach the dhamma um and yeah sometimes he wouldn't sometimes he refused to teach if he thought the other person wasn't ready so uh, if we can keep ourselves receptive and willing to learn then we're more likely to have our views straightened out over time yeah mm -hmm. 
So, uh, Shirley, you want to say a few words to end? We don't have Minori today. Oh, and then also, just in case I forget, tomorrow morning is Metta Meditation, 9 till 10. Well, thank you very much, uh, Venerables. Um, I, I want to say a few words about generosity. And I think um, generosity is a, it's a, it's a natural response to gratitude to want to sort of give something back. It's also a very skillful and beautiful state. Uh, and Ajahn Brahmali talked about these beautiful states that we can cultivate, um, you know, as a as to to sort of help us on our path to actually kickstart us on our path and maintain us. And generosity is one of these very basic things. And also, on a more practical level, it keeps um, Venerable Chanda and Upeka alive because they completely depend on 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 food, clothing and housing and medical care on the generosity of others. So please, um, this is just an invitation to give what you can to support. And also not only just the, the, the physical needs of, of, of um, the venerable ones, but also to um, provide a, a, a suitable premises. There's a small premises now, but a larger premises where women can ordain to be fully, fully or fully fully ordained bhikkhunis so which is very sort of limited in, in 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 this world particularly in the uk so to do that i actually i did another little error with the with the with the chat um and i have put further up i've put the email and the um and the um website so you can donate by um money by going to the website and you can also contact the team Anukampa about other ways to help, like a weekly shop or offering the... Um, so go to the website and you can find out details of how to help or anything more specific or offering practical help or skills, you can email team Anukampa. So um, that's not quite as coherent as Minori, but uh, no comparison. <laughs> it's incomparable, Shirley. <laughs> so, so beautifully said. Yes. Okay. So okay. thank you again. And uh, yes, if you can, yes, generosity is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's how the lay people and the monastic Sangha support each other uh, by we are suffering sort of material requisites and the Sangha offering their wisdom and inspiration and example. <laughs> yeah thank you very much and you also offer your wisdom and example i have to say um by yeah just expressing the dhamma and taking interest in the dhamma and practicing the dhamma and uh being part of this lovely online group so that's great and i hope that tomorrow some of you will join for the meta meditation and uh what else is happening we have a one-day retreat in cambridge in june so far, very small. We only have a few people, but that's okay. Small is beautiful. But if anybody else would like to come, then that's on the 17th of June. And of course, Ajahn Brahm's uh, tour in November is registering right now. So there's a couple of mini retreats there and lots of talks as well. Uh, yeah, and soon we'll be sharing all the videos, all the teachings from Ajahn Brahm Molly's tour with you as well. So... Hope to see you somewhere soon. We can unmute you now and wave goodbye. <laughs>